Are y'all ready to dive into the Word of God? So today I'm, uh, I'm preaching on a subject that I'm very personally passionate about. I love this subject. I'm going to be talking about raising champions, raising champions. When I say that, I think of that, uh, that song, dun, 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 rising up, you know. <laughs> Raise champions. Uh, family, look at me for a moment. I just, I want you to know that God loves your children. He loves your grandchildren. He loves your legacy. The very first command he gave to Adam and Eve was to be fruitful and multiply. God is passionate about children. He's passionate about the next generation. He's a God of generations. Last week when we opened this series, we were talking about he's a multi-generational God. And he desires for your family to be mighty in the earth. And it's not just about you. It really is about uh, decades and centuries even of how God wants to use your family line to bless the earth. And uh, I, I just want to say this as I get started. I understand lots of different life seasons going on in the room. Uh, many people are single. Uh, some people are single and, and hating it. Some people are single and loving it. And I understand that, that, that there are all kinds of different walks. And so today's message uh, may be something that you're like, well, I'm not even parenting somebody. Does this matter to me? But what I'm going to be talking about today is Christian ideals from a biblical worldview of how children should be parented. And, and maybe you have grandkids, or maybe you have grandkids at your house because your kid's doing something crazy. I don't know, but you find yourself in a position where you're parenting again. And I'm just going to highlight from the Word some principles about parenting that we should all embrace, and I believe these are ideals because God loves our, our families. So let's just pray right now. Lord, we know this topic is very important to you and how we raise up children. And so, Lord, I just pray over the next few moments Holy Spirit, that you take over, that you use my words. It, it's not my words, but it's you speaking through your word to your people. Lord, we pray right now for our kids. We love them, our teenagers, Lord, those that are uh, under 10 years old in K through 5, and Lord, those who are in that infant stage. Lord, we love our children. We just pray that you would teach us today through your word. Convict us where we could do better. Encourage us where we're doing good. And Holy Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I want to turn to the scriptures. We're going to read two passages. The first one is going to be Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. And this one is quoted a whole lot. Uh, and then we're also going to go to Psalm chapter 127, verse 3 and 4. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says this, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Say, train up. Train up. We gotta, we've got to train up children. Then Psalm chapter 127, verse 3 says, Children are a gift from the Lord. Some people look at children as a burden. Like, oh my God, I can't wait till they're out of the house. I can't wait. Or they find out that they're pregnant and expecting a child, and they're like, oh God, why, why, God, why? Children are a gift from the Lord, you have to understand that children are more valuable than money. Children are more valuable. There literally is no price tag you could put on a child. Uh, the, the life of a child is so precious in the eyes of the Lord. He loves that child. So the best thing you can do about your children is get excited about them, be passionate about them, understand that this is a gift from God. It's one of God's greatest treasures. I'm telling you, your job is not more important than your children. Actually, nothing is more important than that precious gift that the Lord is entrusting into your hands. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. I think about that for my life. I'm raising up four arrows that are going to go into the world and are going to do some amazing things. And you know what? God has put some arrows in your quiver. God has put some incredible young people in your quiver. I want you to wave at me if there is just some young people in your life. I'm telling you, like just young people in your life, children, grandchildren, nephews, uh, nieces. And I want you to know that there are arrows that God is placing in our hands. When that word says to train up a child in the way they should go, it really has three implications. One is like a little tender plant that is right springing out of the ground 
It is still flexible. It's like a little green shoot. It hasn't solidified yet, and it can be shaped. Uh, two years ago, I tried to grow cucumbers. I'll just admit I didn't do a good job. Uh, I didn't train the plant in the way it should go. I just let it go. <laughs> train means to shape in infancy. And isn't it true that a child's life in the first five years are so tender, so moldable, so shapeable? But, you know, if you look at a giant oak tree that is, like, sturdy and rooted in the ground and strong, try to shape that. You're not shaping that. You can cut off a, a, a branch, but you're not shaping that. And, and I want you to know this, that that child in the first five to ten years of their life is so moldable, so shapeable, and truly you're training what they will always return to. That scripture says train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it because you've shaped them at a young age. Can you see how critical this is to train up a child? This also means, and the Hebrew word for this means to start on the right path. You're never going to get to the right destination if you start on the wrong path. Uh, a few years back, I went on a family vacation, and uh, me and Angie were talking, and I went to Interstate 12, and I was supposed to go west because our vacation was in Texas. And instead, as I was talking, I just got on the interstate and started driving east. And we were just deep in a conversation. And uh, by the time we got to Hammond, <laughs> I realized, what's up? You're never going to get to Texas by going east. This train up a child in the way she goes, start them on the right path. So as you get them launched in the right path, then when they're old, they will not depart from it. The final meaning of this from the Hebrew is like a, a, a target, like a bullseye. Everyone knows if you have a gun, the, the gun, even if the barrel is two or three inches long or a, a longer gun, a rifle, uh, could be 18 inches, 20 inches, whatever the case may be. Uh, but it's shooting up to even miles away. But whatever happens in that barrel determines where it's going. And the years that you have with your child is like the barrel, and you're determining where it's going. So aim that thing in the right direction. So what is the urgency of this season of training children? Well, the urgency is this. Your children are being trained either way. Either you're training them or culture is training them, but they are being trained. Something is shaping them, and this is extremely urgent because, look at me, culture has an agenda, a very strong agenda, a very strong philosophy, a very strong worldview, and they want to train your children, and they will do whatever they can to get access to your children, to get into their minds, to shape their minds, because they want to change the future. They want the future to look how they feel like it should, 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 should be, but as children of God, we know that there is a biblical worldview, that God has ideals, and so either you can train them or the world will train them, but I don't know, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. I want to know if I have anybody in here that wants to partner with God to raise children in his way. I tell you, the power that God has placed in our hands, and I'll just say this from a geographical standpoint, Louisiana's future depends on how we are raising our children. You are raising the mayors and the governors and the leaders of tomorrow. You truly are. You think about that responsibility and that weight. Train up a child in the way they should go. So as I reflected in the scriptures and just said, who is the best parent in the scriptures? I could think of none better than Father God. Father God is the best parent. And Jesus actually was born and had to go through these years. And many people think, oh, Jesus was, he was, um, like, he knew everything when he was a two-year-old. No, but we know that he was all God, but he was all man, and he grew in, in his stature, and he grew in wisdom and favor with God and with man. And so how did the Father God train up Jesus? We know that he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. There were times when God the Father had to tell him no, when Jesus said, Father, let this cup pass from me. And the Father said, no. So we see moments of discipline. We see moments where the Father was shaping Jesus through obedience. And so let's look at what I'm going to give you is three of the major 
training mechanisms that the father used that we can use with our children. Now, I, I will say this right off the bat. I love this subject. I could preach six, eight sermons on this easy because I feel like it's that valuable. So, but today I'm gonna give you three of what I think are the most potent, the most powerful training mechanisms used by the father that we can also use. Are you ready? Training mechanism number one, model. And I'll just say, I think this is the most powerful training mechanism there is, the power of model. This is unfortunate, but I've learned this. I have four kids now, and I'm just saying everything I'm preaching today, I'm living. I have a 14-year-old, a 12-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 6-year-old. They're tremendous children. They're, they're, God's going to use them in such a powerful way. Already is using them. But I'm learning this, that kids don't do what you say. They do what you do. They do not do what you say, they do what you do. And they may reluctantly obey when you say, but they will ultimately reflect exactly who you are. And this is where the hard work comes in because we actually have to live this stuff out. So let's look at how Jesus learned from his father. John 5, verse 19. So Jesus explained, I tell all of you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. I've learned this to be true. Uh, <laughs> if I use certain slang words, I can hear it from the back of the car. And I'm like, where did they pick that up? I can only do what I see the father do. It's so funny, I have a friend who moved away, but they're from Louisiana. And you know, us Louisiana folks have accents. And I know we don't think we have accents because we all talk to each other and it sounds just fine. But you can spot us anywhere. We're like as bad as Texas or Mississippi, we're unique. And uh, their, their little son was talking to me recently and he sounded like a Louisiana boy, even though they live in a different place. And I was like, man, as the father does, so does the son, and this thing passes on, and this is how it is. So this, this training mechanism is three, seen in three different areas. The first is we're going to model character. Character. We're not just going to teach them character. We're going to live out character. We're not going to say be a hard worker, and we're lazy ourselves. We're going to be hard workers, and they will become hard workers. We're not going to say be honest, and we exaggerate, we lie, we hide truths, we tell half-truths. No, we're going to be truthful people, and they will demonstrate truthfulness. We're not going to wish that they showed up on time when we're late for everything. If you're late for everything, they will say, you know what? It's okay to be late for everything. We're not going to say don't lose your temper and us fly off the handle at stuff. We're gonna model character. God help us model character for our, for our young people. Their conscious is steered by your example. Pause, can I just say that one more time? Their conscious is steered by your example. What they are learning by watching you, when they're 30 and 40 years old, they will call right and wrong by what they saw you do. So their literal consciences are being steered by your example, your example of character. So the second way that we're going to train them in our model is we're gonna model spirituality. So I love the fact that you guys are in the house of God on Sunday morning. I feel like that's incredible because that's showing to them a value for God's house. But I believe it goes much deeper than that. The power of a parent who gets up in the morning and reads their word in front of their children. The power of a parent who spends time in prayer. The power of a parent who takes every opportunity to pray with their young person. The power of a parent who is deeply spiritual and truly worships God. Do you know that they're going to worship God how you worship God? Some of my favorite pictures of my family that the team here will take is if, if I'm worshiping God, and I don't even realize it, but my little kid is sitting next to me lifting their hands exactly like their dad. They don't know why they're lifting their hands. They don't know why they're doing what they're doing. They're just doing it because daddy's doing it. Model spirituality. And uh, I'm going to talk about my parents right now. They're in the room, but I'm just going to block them out and act like they're not here. And just let me just brag on them for a moment. Tremendous parents. My parents were tremendous parents. But when I was growing up, um, 
several key moments stick out to me. One of the best things we could do was to come with my dad early in the morning to church. So we would wake up around five in the morning and my dad would select one of us to come with him to church. And that was like the highlight of our, of our little worlds was to go with dad to church on a Sunday morning. And the room would be dark, no persons in the room. And my dad would lay hands on every single chair in the building and pray for the person who was going to sit there that day and say, God, speak to this person. And he would have us lay our hands on the chairs and pray for the chairs. And to this day, those memories have stuck out to me as the model of spirituality. I would wake up and I would see my dad in another room in the dark on his knees praying while it was still dark outside. Talk about a model. We'd be in the car driving somewhere, and my dad would be praying in the Holy Spirit. And this is, I didn't even know what praying in the Spirit was. I'd be like, what is he saying? What are those words? What is he talking about? For 30 minutes from point A to point B, modeling spirituality. I watched my mom's hunger for theology, for the Word of God, and I would see her when most people were reading romance novels. My mom's reading theology. She's, she's reading St. Augustine, you know? And, and, and just that hunger for the Lord and modeling spirituality, it shaped who I I am. And I watch that with my children, and, and they are doing exactly what they see their father doing. So we model our character, we model our spirituality, and the final thing is that we're modeling our passions. They're going to be passionate about what we're passionate about, and all of us have different skill sets, different talents, and we're pursuing different things, but your kids will ultimately inherit the passions of their parents. I have a friend who's into fitness, and this guy is like Mr. Fit, uh, does jujitsu, works out, he runs, he eats healthy, he does all the stuff, and he's got three kids, and I watched him now growing up. He's got two of them are teenagers, and one of them is under 10, but all of them are super fit. They all are super athletic, and they do exactly what mom and dad are doing because they're passionate about it. My kids, not so much. We just watch their kids and are inspired. <laughs> like, man, wouldn't that be cool? But they're following the passions of their parents. For, for my family, it's music. I've always been passionate about music. I have, I have guitars, places. I have piano. I've got little things you can play drums on. And uh, we got a cello. we got all kinds of musical instruments. At my house, it is very normal for the kids to sing and play. And I promise you, you're going to hear from my kids because they are becoming incredibly talented in their gift. But that's because that's what daddy does. And, and they will do what you do. So here is the point. What is the action from this point? Here is the action. Be the person you wish them to be. Be the person you wish them to be. Don't just be filled with wishes. Oh, I wish they would do this, and I told them that they should do this, and I'm trying to tell them to do this. Just be the person you want them to be, and they will model it straight up. Amen? Okay, the second mechanism that I find super, super powerful is the mechanism of environments. Environments. Environments shape people, just like plants are shaped by environments. So there's a little store, a grocery store here close to our South Baton Rouge campus called Fresh Market. I love Fresh Market. It's a cool little grocery store. They play classical music. Uh, and I, I like classical music. Something about classical music makes you feel smart. <laughs> Listen to some Bach, and you feel like, hey, hey I, I'm intelligent. <laughs> so they play classical music while you walk around and shop. And something about that, I just, I feel like grabbing an apple. <laughs> or just, I feel healthy just walking around the store. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm elevated or something. And I... I've learned this about creativity is you put yourself in the right environment and you unlock creativity. Uh, actually, your environment unlocks a lot of stuff. And many times it unlocks wrong things. You put yourself in wrong environments and you are capable of insane things. Put yourself in right environments and you'll be amazed at what comes out of you, what creativity comes out of you. I do know this, that I can't just prepare sermons anywhere. There are certain places where I am, certain environments that I am. I posture myself in places and, and creativity flows out or the, the right things flow out. And, and your kids are becoming the environments, not that they subject themselves to, but that you place them in. 
So let's watch how the Father is training Jesus through environments. Matthew 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. So <laughs> the wilderness, what an environment for the Father to send the Son into to be tested by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. So just like the first point, I'm going to give you three specific points on environments. Environments, number one, are people. People are environments. We know this in the first few years of a child's life, the most influential voice in their life is their parents, without a question. But as they go to school, there's been so much research that shows that their teacher can become an equivalent voice in its gravity. That's a powerful thing, to realize where you put them in school is actually shaping the person they're becoming we're not just putting them anywhere. We're being very prayerful, very strategic about where we put our kids. We want to know who's teaching our children. We want to know who they're in the classroom with. But then research says that they go through that phase, but they emerge into another phase where their friends actually become a greater voice than their teachers and their parents, their friends, their peers. So if you want to still shape their lives when they're 10 and 15 years old, Choose their friends. Choose their friends. No, we're not hanging out with them. I like that person. Let's, let's hang out with them. We're shifting the environment by choosing the people that are having influence into their lives. Don't just let it happen. Set that environment of people. The second environment that we're going to be very concerned about is the content that they're consuming. I know that I don't need to go off the rails and talk all about this, but you just cannot set them with a phone in the other room and press autoplay and just say, babysitter Netflix is going to take care of it all. <laughs> Trustworthy YouTube has got this all figured out. They want to train your children. So you take responsibility over the content that they're consuming. It grieves my heart to know that there are some young people that are left to their own devices and see stuff they should never see, hear things they should never hear, and they're being shaped. Their little worldviews are being trained by the content that they're consuming. Social media at too young of an age is, is like feeding them poison. They can't handle it. Their little identities can't take it. They don't know how to handle it. Mom and dad, please don't let, I know you feel you want to set them up an a, a Instagram account and give them access to TikTok and they're nine years old and 10 years old. You really don't know the death trap that you're setting for them at that young of an age. I, I, can I just say it like this? We don't let kids drive till they're 16 years old, but you put them in another room with a device that has no restrictions on there, and you're like, I don't know how to, you know, do the passwords and restrict. You better figure it out. You better figure it out because what that young man sees at eight years old and nine years old could shape his destiny. And I can say this because I've met with so many people and I've seen so many lives destroyed. Do you know how many people struggle with sexual issues in their adult life because when they were seven and eight years old, they got exposed to something that messed them up? And so be responsible with the content that they're consuming. Less is way more. I would rather them not know and be like, well, they have, they have a YouTube account, and they have a this, and that's cool. That's cool. We're not. We're not going to do that. So then they get to a certain age, and they can handle the world. And that's when you responsibly let them into the world. So just giving you some, some, some godly advice. The content that you allow them to see is the environment you're setting. So the people, the content, and the final thing is the geography. Where you drop them off, where you let them go. Some parents are just like, I just need a break. So I'm just going to put them over here at this person's house. Do you know their uncle? Do you know their aunt? Do you know? You say, I'm just going to put them over there for a sleepover. Do you know? No. No. <laughs> I trust my house. I don't know about yours and yours and yours. 
I trust my house. I'm training champions. I, we're not just throwing our kids to the wolves, letting them go over to this sleep, over this camp, out this thing. We're, no, we're protective over our kids. I want to know every single person at the party. I want to know who's, at, who's over the party. Where's he been? What's his name? Let's do a background check on this guy. <laughs> I'm all up in the business. So I talk to you like you're my family, okay? So I, that's, that's how I want you to process what I'm telling you. You have to be very careful with the homes you allow them to go into. Don't just say, oh, they, go home with them, that's fine. You don't know what they watch on television. You don't know what they have in their bedrooms. You don't know who's allowed to have devices and who can watch and who can... So, I would much rather you hold it close and show your love to them and protect them than just expose them to, to everything out there in the world. Amen? Amen? So we have training mechanism number one, our model. Training mechanism number two, environments. The final training mechanism I'll give you is the word logos. I chose logos over words or communication because I like the Greek word logos in that it, it really entails all communication that takes place through writing, through hearing, through, it, it's, it's a full encapsulated word that talks about communication to them. And this is a mechanism that we're gonna use. Matthew chapter three, verse 16. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son, who brings me great joy. The father communicated with his son constantly. He publicly affirmed him. There was communication that took place and your words are so powerful in shaping who your young person is becoming. What you tell them they're great at, they will do more. What you affirm, they will pour the gas on. They are becoming what you are saying to them. Your words are so powerful, so powerful. That's why you have to Watch what you say. You cannot just be, um, you can't be without control when you use your words with them. Your words are defining them. How many adults can look back and say, this person told me I'd never amount to anything, or this person told me they believed in me, and this person and their word, their, the world is being shaped. And there's three types of words that matter, and, and, and I'm going to give them to you as I, as I feel like they're important. Okay? This first one may shock you. But I feel like the first word that is super important that every parent needs to know is the word no. Oh, that's so unkind that that's your first word. Okay, but, but some people maybe overuse this word. But the word no, and I want you to consider that little plant that's tender. It's just is going everywhere that it wants to go. It'll grow this way and that way, and it grows every way until something says no. And that no puts a little staple in the wall and trains that plant. Your no is so powerful from those ages one through five. If they cannot learn the word no in that stage, you have multiplied the difficulty of them understanding the word no. So what are, first, what are kids, you think that their first word is mama, but it's actually no. They're searching for no. They want to know where no is. I have a nephew that says no like this. Mm, no. He winds that thing up, man. Mm, no. Because he's just trying to figure out where no. And, and, and so our response to that is no, <laughs> you know. They're searching for no. Uh, it's important that you, that you can say no. And I see parents struggle with this all the way through their kids' lives. When they're teenagers, they, they want to put restrictions there, but they, they, they spoil them too bad. They can't say no. No, you can't go to that party. No, you can't hang out there. And they don't have the ability to say no. And if you don't say no when they're one to five, try to say it when they're 15. Try. <laughs> try. If you teach them no, when they're young, when they're a teenager, no is not a, a big bad word. It's just no. It's just a boundary. 
So no. The second word that's powerful is the word wow. Wow. I love the word wow. I had one of my kids came home recently and said, Dad, I'm writing at a college level. They checked me out, and I'm writing at a college level. And you know what I said? Wow. wow. What? College level? Yeah. And so they, they changed the subject, and I was like, no. <laughs> college level? Wow. You know, I was just affirming. Your wow is so powerful. My son is playing basketball, his second year playing basketball, and uh, what can I say? <laughs> I love watching him. I love watching him play. But in his last game, he ran up and did a layup and made the, 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 the shot. And then he got fouled, and he made a foul shot. <laughs> wow! <laughs> wow! You know, some parents hold back their wow because, and, and you know, some parents are great at the word no, or they're too good at the word no, and they're horrible at this word wow because they just, they don't, I don't want to give them false hope. I don't want to spoil them with my affirmation. No, man, give them so much affirmation. Tell them how much you love them. Tell them how much, I mean, they're, they're your priority. My kids, I don't hold back any of that wow. And the final thing, and this one probably could be the most important, is the word tell me, tell me. This is a parent who will listen. Children will love those who listen to them. They will love those who listen to them. So if you become a very attentive listener, uh, I think it's appropriate to try to spend at least 15 minutes of quality time with your children every single day, each one of them. Tell me about your day. Oh, did they say that? Why did they say that? Tell me more, but who else was in the class? What did you say? Oh, yeah, how, did they all laugh? And they, you're, just, you're just inquisitive. Three rules of this tell me, and then we're going to pray and, and be done. First is be fully present. Put your cell phone down. Don't listen, don't listen with your phone in your eyes to where they know they don't actually have you. Put it down. You know, sometimes it can be hard listening to kids. I had one that went through a stage that uh, th they said, and um, 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 and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then. And they couldn't get it out. So I was like, oh my gosh, I gotta, you know. But <laughs> lean in and be super attentive. Don't be distracted. Second is reflective listening, it means you're repeating back to them what they're saying, and, and so they understand that you're actually listening. And third, avoid interrupting. Yes, I know, you, I know you know it all, but just can it for a little bit and let them talk, let them listen. You know, it's the same with marriage, but sometimes if you'll just be quiet for a second, let three or four seconds come by, and this is what I've learned about kids, is kids are not as bottled up tight as adults are. Kids, if you give them three seconds of space, they're going to come out with their deepest, darkest secret. Just be quiet for just about three or four seconds, and then they'll come out with something that's mind-blowing. Just give them space. Be attentive. And, hey, if you forget everything else that I've said, and don't because you need it, but this is the most important thing that I'll say all day. We're talking about power families. There are many multi-billionaires who within one to two generations have lost all the wealth and their kids are on drugs, in institutions, committing suicide, and they don't have legacy. Legacy is not money. So I want you to hear this. The only thing that is consistent that creates legacy over multiple generations through possibly even centuries is God. God is the common denominator for legacy. He visits the children and the grandchildren. So above everything else, get in their world, God. Make God the first priority in their lives. People have misinterpreted this passage, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. They look at it as a promise. 
It's not a promise. It's a proverb. Okay? You see people that say, I, I, did, I trained them in a way to go, and how did it happen? It's because every single one of us are autonomous people that must have relationships with God. God is the only thing that makes us last from generation to generation. And so train up your children in godliness to love the Lord and serve the Lord, and you will have a power family. Amen. So I, this is how I want us to pray. I want us to pray right now for our parenting. I want us to pray for our children and for our grandchildren. And so I want you to close your eyes and I want you to have in your mind, in your heart, first of all, your immediate family. I want you to think of the children that are in your household and the grandchildren that are in your household. And I want you to call out their names to the Lord. God loves them more than you do, but he's made you steward over their little lives. Father, we call out the names of our children to you. Thank you for entrusting us with children. They're an inheritance from the Lord. They're a reward from you. They're like arrows in our hands. Lord, I pray right now for my beautiful family. I thank you for Evie and Andy and Beckham and Savannah. And Lord, who they're being shaped into. They're becoming mighty in the earth. And Lord, they're going to have kids who are mighty in the earth, and each generation, Lord, will be visited with your presence. Lord, we call out the names of our children to you, and we just say, bless our families, Lord. Bless our children. And Lord, we ask you to help us as we parent our children. Lord, we want to be like you. We want a father like you did. Lord, help us to be godly parents that model character, model spirituality, model passions. God, help us to put our children in environments with the right people. Lord, help us to filter content from their eyes. Lord, help us to place them in the right settings and the right placements for their training and development. Lord, give us the strength to be able to say no. Give us the ability to affirm. Lord, we just ask you to bless our children, bless our families. In Jesus' name, amen.